A question we ask ourselves a lot on this channel is, what's been happening recently in the world of archaeology? No matter how many times we ask it, we're never disappointed with the answer. There's always something new and exciting happening. Because of that, we're always able to bring you interesting and informative videos like this one. Let's get on with it. Finding gold is always a fantastic experience for an archaeologist. But some gold discoveries are better than others. This one from southwest Germany is special. In May 2021, a team of archaeologists working in the Tumbingen district discovered the oldest gold artifact ever found in the region. It's a small, precious gold spiral recovered from the grave of a woman who lived and died during the Bronze Age. According to the experts, it's 3,800 years old. It's a historic find for Germany, but it's not German in origin. Analysis of the gold suggests that it actually came from Cornwall in England. Historians have always believed that there was a fairly extensive trade network in Europe all that time ago, but evidence like this is very rare. The spiral was probably worn as a hair ornament and so suggests that this was a woman of high social status during her lifetime. She was buried facing south, which is a tradition of the late Neolithic era. It's very old, but not the oldest piece of gold jewelry ever found in Europe. You'd have to go back in time more than 7,000 years to beat that. What can a tiny collection of stone tools tell us about relations between Indonesian hunter-gatherers and Aboriginal Australians thousands of years ago? When we say a tiny collection, we don't mean the number of artifacts. We mean the artifacts themselves are literally tiny. These small but highly precise stone implements are unique. They were probably made by Talian people who lived in the area 8,000 years ago. Nothing like them has ever been found anywhere other than Sulawesi, Indonesia and a few locations in Australia. That suggests that there was contact and perhaps an exchange of ideas between the regions, but that doesn't fit with what we currently understand of the Talians. Historians currently think of them as little more than hunter-gatherers, but the sophistication of the recently discovered tools implies otherwise. It might be the case that the cultural exchange came from the aboriginals traveling and meeting the Talians rather than vice versa. But it's still a surprising theory. We can't rule out the idea that the two cultures came up with the same idea about tiny tools at the same time. That would be a huge coincidence. There's been a lot of archaeological focus on ancient Greek sites in Turkey recently. The town of Assos has proven to be an especially fruitful hunting ground for researchers and finds like this one are a reason why. It's a sculpture of a lion made 2200 years ago during the Hellenist era. Back when it was made, Assos was called Apollonia and was a strategically important port in Greek city-state, perfectly positioned to receive visitors and trade from the nearby Greek island of Lesbos. It's thought that the building that the lion was discovered inside was once an inn. A stone oven was also found at the same site, although that's more like 1,500 years ago, and so is a product of the Byzantine age. Who made the lion and why is unknown, but perhaps the fact that it was found inside an old inn isn't a coincidence. There are many pubs and bars across Europe called the White Lion today. Perhaps that's a naming tradition that goes back thousands of years. Excavations have been ongoing in Asso since 1981 and aren't scheduled to end anytime soon. The events of 2020 gave us all a chance to focus on our hobbies for a while and perhaps even pick up some new ones. In Denmark, thousands of people turned their hands to metal detectoring for the first time and they came up with some wonderful results. One of the most striking is this beautiful golden fibula known as the Fibula Engegard Nord. Pens like this one were used to fasten cloaks or clothing during the Iron Age, but very few are as ornate or decorative as this one. The nature of its design suggests that it belonged to either a priest, a leader, or someone of enormous wealth. Back then, there's no reason why all three roles couldn't be held by one person. Danish archaeologists are also swamped with finger rings, old coins, and silver buttons from clothing, all of which have been handed in by members of the public keen to find out if they've discovered something valuable. 
Most of the discoveries will turn out to have a higher cultural value than a financial one, but in the case of this stunning fibula, it's safe to say that it would make big money if it was ever to go to auction. If you have a powerful telescope, you can use it to look into the night sky and find a star called Algol, which forms part of the constellation of Perseus. The star wasn't officially discovered by astronomers until the 18th century, but it appears that the ancient Egyptians were aware of it far earlier. They knew it as the Demon Star, and they wrote about it in a recently discovered papyrus manuscript known as Cairo Calendar 86637. Amazingly, the document is 3,200 years old. What the Egyptians couldn't possibly have known is that Algol is actually a binary star system. The stars orbit each other, and when one eclipses the other, the brightness of the star system as seen from Earth dips a little. Each period of relative dimness lasts for 2.85 days, which is the period measured on the Egyptian calendar. The Egyptians considered this to be a supernatural act, hence the name they used for it. Even the name Al-Gol has supernatural connections, though. It comes from the Arabic for ghoul. Historians often find themselves mystified by the level of understanding Egyptians had of astronomy. But this find might be the most mystifying of them all. When you're bored, why not play a board game? They've been a way of passing the time for thousands of years. Sadly, we've forgotten the rules of some of the more ancient board games, which is why we're not quite sure what to make of this rustic-looking medieval board game brick. It was found in a recent excavation of Vyborg Castle in Leningrad Oblast, Russia. Making the board was a simple process of carving a grid onto clay and then firing it. Archaeologists have seen designs like this before, and think it might be a board for a game called table, which translates into English as mill. If they're right, the game would be played a little like chess. Each player would start with nine pieces and attempt to capture the other player's pieces by creating a row of three in any direction. The design of the grids appears to vary a lot from place to place, though, so there's no way of knowing if they're all part of the same game or different versions based on an older idea. The castle was built during the 13th century, so it's reasonable to assume the board is just as old. When you're considering visiting a city on vacation, you do a little research first. Part of that is because you want to know where to go when you're there, but it's just as important to know where not to go. If you were thinking of visiting London, England during the 14th century, it would be useful to have sight of this so-called medieval murder map. It takes data recorded by coroners between the years 1300 and 1340 and overlays incidences of violent deaths onto the city streets, thus allowing visitors to see where the danger hotspots are. Aside from showing just how dangerous some of London's streets were during those years, it also comes with a key explaining the circumstances of each death. Some of them are truly bizarre. One man was murdered by a violent mob who were infuriated with him littering the street with eel skins from his market stall. Statistically speaking, the most dangerous place to visit is a stretch of road in Cheapside between St. Mary Le Beau Church and St. Paul's Cathedral. We're sure the city's tourist board would like us to point out that it's a much safer area today. You'd expect to find a crucifix in every Christian church in Europe and you usually do. You won't find any others like this one in the Cathedral of St. Martin in Lucca, Italy, though. This stunning wood sculpture showing Christ on the cross is eight feet long and intricately detailed. It's not a new discovery, but the information we're about to give you is. As of late 2020, it's been confirmed as the oldest wooden statue in Europe. The statue had never been radiocarbon dated before because it's a holy relic, but an exception was made in 2020 to mark the 950th anniversary of the cathedral's dedication. The bishop hoped to prove that the statue was as old as the cathedral itself. Instead, he found out that it was much older. Rather than being a product of the 11th century, the three fragments of wood and one fragment of canvas that were tested turn out to be from either the late 8th century or the early 9th. 
There's no record of its existence before it was presented by Bishop Anselmo de Biagio at the consecration of the cathedral in the year 1070. But it must have been around somewhere. While we're talking about things being older than people expected it to be, let's discuss the history of writing in Europe. For a very long time, the tablets from the Petsus House at Mycenae were thought to be the oldest examples of the written word on the continent. But that was until another clay tablet was discovered in Greece in March 2021. It's only a fragment of the full tablet, measuring just 2 inches by 3 inches, but it predates the Petsus House tablets by at least 150 years. The origin of writing in Europe has therefore been pushed back to around 3450 years ago. This discovery comes as an archaeological survey in the middle of an olive grove in Kleina, southern Greece. It would be wonderful if the text contained some kind of wisdom from the ancient world, but alas, that's not the case. It appears to be a record of some kind of manufacturing process, with numbers listed on one side and the names of men listed on the other, along with a verb that translates roughly as manufacturing. In other words, the history of bureaucracy goes back as far as the history of writing. If you've ever shared a bed with someone who snores, you know how much of an issue it can be. They're fast asleep and getting their rest while you're wide awake because of the constant noise. This isn't a new problem, and it was just as irritating for people in the Bronze Age as it is for people today. That's why they made snoring aids, and they looked strikingly similar to the type of snoring aid that's still manufactured today. It would have been considerably more uncomfortable to wear, though, because it's made of stone. The proportions of the device appear to have been precisely tailored to fit the upper and lower jaws of its owner, which is a remarkable dental accomplishment for something that's believed to be 3,500 years old. We're not sure how effective it would have been, but it's amusing to imagine a Bronze Age couple arguing about whether the snorer would have to wear it to bed or not. The unusual artifact is now on display in the world's only snoring museum, which is in Bodmin, Cornwall, England. Here's an opportunity to solve a crime. In May 2021, someone stole the rosary beads that St. Mary of Scots wore to her beheading in 1587. The beads are usually held at Arundel Castle in West Sussex, but vanished at some point on May 25th. Police fear they've already found their way onto the black market. The most frustrating thing about the theft is that the beads aren't even especially valuable from a material point of view. They're very much like every other set of rosary beads you've ever seen, albeit a little more elaborate. They might look like they're made of gold, but they aren't, which is probably going to be a disappointment for the thieves. The theft happened in the dead of night and is thought to have been assisted by someone associated with the castle because the criminals somehow knew how to avoid the various CCTV cameras on their way in and out of the building. It's probably a little unlikely that they'll end up on a marketplace near you, but if they do, call the police. When you're dealing with an ancient Egyptian mummy, sometimes there's more to it than just the mummy itself. As a case in point, here's the material that was once wrapped around the Zagreb mummy, which was acquired by a Croatian businessman in 1848 and donated to the State Museum of Croatia in 1877. It wasn't until much later that someone noticed that there was something a little unusual about the mummy's wrapping. That wrapping is now known as the Liber Lentus. It's one of the most impressive and important records of the ancient Etruscan written language in the world. It's just a shame that we can't understand what it says. Even now, historians and language experts haven't been able to crack the Etruscan language, so our knowledge is limited. In the past few years, though, we've made enough breakthroughs to arrive at the idea that the subject matter of the Liber Lentus is a calendar of some sort. Most likely, it's a calendar of ritual events. There are even a few academics who suspect it might be the fabled Etrusca Disciplina, an Etruscan cultural text that was held in high regard by the writers of the ancient Roman world, but we've got a lot more translation work to do before we can confirm or deny that. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.
and see you in the next video.